31 years. That's how long it's been since a Republican was elected governor of Washington state. John Spellman was the last Republican to hold the post. In 1980, he defeated then-Democratic State Senator Jim McDermott to become the 18th governor of Washington state. Spellman only served one term. He lost his re-election bid in 1984 to Booth Gardner. And since then, a Democrat has been the governor of Washington state. But in 2012, Republican State Attorney General Rob McKenna hopes to break the Democratic hold on the office. Rob McKenna is here now to talk about his campaign for governor. And welcome, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you. Well, you got some good news this week in the Washington poll that uh, revealed that you uh, have a lead over Jay Inslee, who is uh, likely to be the Democratic uh, opponent for you. You're, you're up there by uh, about almost six points ahead of him. So how do you feel about that? Well, it's, it's consistent with all of the polls that have come out since we both declared. They all have me leading by six or seven points, leading by 15, 16 percent among independents, doing very well in King County and the Seattle area. But as the old saying goes, the only poll that counts is the one that's going to be held next November. So it's a good place to be, but uh, we have a long way to go. And one thing to note out of that, too, there was... Uh Almost 18 percent undecided yet. So oh, of there's course. a lot of work yeah. yet to be done on yeah. both of your sides to uh, try yeah. to attract that undecided vote. Well, let's talk about why you want to be governor. Why would you want to be governor, particularly now with this economic climate as bad as it is, about ready to hit a special session, unemployment over 9 percent? Mm -hmm. uh, why? Well, first of all, I love this state. It's my adopted home. My dad retired from the military after 34 years in the Army, and my parents chose to settle here. And uh, I moved here when I was uh, 14 years old, and it's the first place I'd ever lived for any length of time. I, I grew up overseas more than in the States up to that point. And I, I just uh, have fallen in love with Washington State and its people, and I think I can make a difference. Uh, my vision for the state is what we call the new direction for Washington. It focuses on three things private sector job creation to bring down the nation's uh, you know, uh, fifth highest unemployment rate. Uh, it focuses on reforming and adequately funding our public schools and our higher education system. And it focuses on reforming and uh, revitalizing state government so we have the money and the attitude that will result in better education and more jobs. Uh, it's something I think we can do, and, and the reason I'm in public service and left you know, the private practice of law to begin with was to be in a position to make a difference. Let's talk about education, <clears throat> which uh, you put a big focus on mm -hmm. in your campaign announcement. Although you didn't give many specifics, you said that what you want to do is uh, really increase the funding for public education right. in Washington State. But give me some specifics. Sure. Have you, have you, how are you going to pay for it? Well, by reversing the trend we've been on, which is that public education receives a smaller and smaller share of the state budget pie. Uh, the first thing to understand about the state budget is, is that it grows. On average, it's doubled every 10 years uh, since 1970. Uh, so you have to ask, where do you want to see that next 100% increase in state revenues go? I think a larger amount, a disproportionate amount, ought to go to K-12. We ought to be at about 50% of the state budget being devoted to K-12, not just 43%. That's a difference of billions of dollars per biennium. Secondly, uh, we need to uh, right size and, and make state general government leaner uh, in order to free up money to invest. For example, uh, right now, uh, over 10% of the state budget, over th about $3.5 billion, is spent on one item, health care insurance for state employees and K-12 employees, who pay 12 to 15% of the cost of their premiums. That went up 10.5% in one year. It's not sustainable, and it's eating up funding for higher ed and K-12. So we've got to get cost under control in general government to free up money to invest back into the education system. And we have to give a bigger slice of that growing pie to uh, our public schools and to our universities. Okay, so let me go back again to how you're going to do this, because uh, are we going to then be asking state employees to pay more for their health mm -hmm. insurance? Uh, are you going to be looking at making more cuts in state uh, employees and services? What? The governor has already uh, pointed out that state employees have to pay a bigger share of the health insurance premiums that uh, that they were, you know, that are covered by the state. So, uh, this is something everyone in the private sector is already doing, and in many in many nonprofit organizations, people are paying well above 12 to 15 percent of the cost of their health care insurance. Related to that, though, is that we need to provide uh, more and less expensive plans as options to employees, so they have a greater array of options. Right now, as a state employee, I basically have two choices: 
They're both fairly expensive, although uh, you know, I'm very, very happy with the coverage I received from Group Health. Uh, but we need to provide more plans that are more affordable. Let people build uh, savings accounts with tax-preferred dollars. Let them uh, you know, have a higher self-insured retention, a higher uh, deductible, so they're self-insured for the first 5000 if they want to be. Give them more choices in exchange for less money. And this is crucial. Give them options for wellness plans where they get a break on their premiums, even if they're carrying a higher percentage of the cost of their insurance, in exchange for being enrolled in a wellness program where they commit as consumers to wellness activities, regular screenings, uh, you know, stopping to stop smoking, uh, you know, address obesity, uh, diabetes, and the rest. We have to be a lot more focused on wellness promotion uh, in order to achieve disease prevention, and that in turn will help bring down insurance costs for everybody. You, job creation. What is your uh, vision for this? How yeah. you know on the state level? I don't know that the state actually can create that many jobs other than hiring more state employees. Uh, but they've been going the other way right. lately because of uh, the economy and things like that. But what would you try to do? What are you looking to do to create jobs in the private sector? Well, you're, you're right about the answer not coming from state hiring. We, we are shrinking. We're down about 8.5% overall in the number of employees in state government. My office is down 15% the number of employees I have, uh, and that's because we're trying to save our clients money so they can provide services, you know, for example, to kids. And I, I envision general government shrinking further through attrition. Just through retirements, the number of employees can decline, say, 5% a year or 5% a biennium, depending on how you approach it. What the state needs to do to encourage private sector job creation is to get our state off of a top 10 list that we're on that we really shouldn't be. It's the top 10 most expensive states in which to operate a company and in which to employ people and create jobs. Whether it's the nation's highest unemployment insurance premiums, most expensive or among the most expensive workers' compensation benefits, a very difficult business and occupation tax, particularly for small business, a very difficult regulatory environment. When you add it all together, we are regularly ranked as being one of the most expensive places to start, grow, or move a company. But yet yeah, Forbes magazine has us rated very highly when it comes to business. Yeah, that's because, first of all, it's the only study that concluded that. Secondly, you know, the rank is that high. Secondly, they ignored the business and occupation tax. They didn't factor it in at all. Uh, apparently because they weren't sure what to do with it. We're the only state that has one. Um, so clearly we have certain advantages. Uh, this, is, you know, this is not to say this isn't a good place to do business. It is. But what's retarding job creation, uh, based on conversations I've had with employers of all shapes and sizes across the state, is that it's very, very expensive to create and maintain jobs in the state because of all the factors that I just mentioned. So in terms of what the state can do to actually encourage job creation, we can directly and positively affect the cost of employing people in the state in order to create more jobs. And, and that's what we need to do because, of course, the jobs need to come from not only the private for profit sector, but also from the private non profit sector, you know, for example, healthcare. Tax reform in the state and trying to generate more revenue. Um, would you be willing or are you going to say the old George Bush, no new taxes, read my lips? You know, I, I, when, you, when people talk about raising taxes, what are they saying? We're going to raise property taxes even more? We're going to raise a very high sales tax even more? A difficult B&O tax even more? I, I don't think so. I'm not in favor of raising tax rates. I am in favor of raising tax revenues, which we can do best and first by growing the economy. You know, even in this weak economy, and even with the lower revenue projections for the state, the state is still assuming over $2 billion of new tax revenues in this new two-year budget. That's a 7.1% increase in tax revenues, even under the revised lower forecast. I don't know very many families that are seeing their, their, their income go up over 7%. I don't know very many companies that are seeing their revenues go up over 7%. The state has to live within its means. When you look at our tax structure, I think that everything in it ought to be on the table, including existing tax preferences and exemptions. There ought to be a zero-based budget approach to analyzing whether tax preferences and exemptions and loopholes are still worthwhile, if they ever were. They ought to be evaluated right along with all the spending that we look at regularly, right along with all the regulations that we ought to look at regularly, and we don't. So I'm in favor of everything being on the table for review. That's why there is a joint legislative process today 
that regularly reviews tax preferences and decides what's worth keeping and what's worth and what we should get rid of. Let's talk about some of the uh, issues that are before us right now, the initiatives that are out there. You've sure. already said that you're opposed to the Tim Eyman uh, tolling initiative 1125. Right. You're opposed to the 1163 initiative on health care and training uh, uh, there. Uh, but you haven't said where you stand on 1183. Can you share that with me? I'll, I will share it with you. I, I'm going to vote for Initiative 1183 for, th for three reasons. And, and this is after thinking about it for a long, long time and talking to people on both sides of the issue, including my friends in law enforcement and public safety, as well as in the private sector. Uh, I'm going to vote for it for three reasons. Number one, I've never thought that it was valid or important for the state to be in the hard liquor sales business. There's just no good you know, you know, philosophical reason that we should be selling hard liquor and, and maintaining a monopoly over it. Uh, number two, uh, this measure is m much better thought out than the two liquor privatization measures from last year, which I voted against in both cases. For one, because it maintains a reasonable level of regulation over alcohol sales. It does not completely deregulate hard liquor sales, and I would be opposed to that kind of complete deregulation. I don't want to see uh, vodka and other spirits sold in every corner convenience store, for example. Uh, number three, unlike the measures last year, it provides an, a significant net increase in revenues flowing to the state, partly because the state no longer has to bear the costs for running liquor stores and carrying, uh, carrying those costs. And finally, I wanted to take a look at what the experience of other states has been when they moved in this direction, states like Iowa and Pennsylvania. And there have been extensive studies done by uh, uh, researchers to see, did teenage drinking and access to alcohol go up? Did DUIs uh, go up? Did other social problems related to higher alcohol consumption go up? In fact, did alcohol consumption go up? And those studies in those states found they didn't find. They found that there were no social problem increases of that type. So I think based on the experience of those other states, and you know, even California, which is much more liberal than we would be under this new law, uh, which hasn't seen DUI increases, I think that uh, we can, we can uh, accept the higher levels of revenue, get the state out of the business, and not see the increase in social problems that uh, we worry about. And I think that's why you know, people like former Sheriff Dale Branlin, uh, Al O'Brien, a former Seattle police officer and legislator, have come out strongly in favor of 1183, uh, you know, not only because of the revenues, but importantly because the penalties for illegal sales of alcohol to minors are greatly enhanced, and they believe there'll be even more effective enforcement of the law. Uh, let me follow up on this quickly, because uh, sure. I want to get to a couple of other issues uh, time-wise here. But... Um, Many people have really objected to the fact that Costco has poured so much money into this initiative, $22 million, and they tend to look at it, particularly in these times where we have Occupy, Seattle, mm -hmm. Wall Street, Portland, wherever, uh, the whole idea of a corporation buying an, an, I, I find an election. I find that incredibly ironic and, frankly, cynical uh, on the part of the people running the Vote No campaign. When you consider that Costco uh, is... Uh, led by people who are heavy Democratic Party donors. They, they, you know, they're very supportive of their workforce. They're supportive of unions. Uh, they're very socially conscious. They, put, they pump a lot of money into our local uh, uh, nonprofit agencies. Uh, yes, Costco you know, clearly has a financial interest in this, but uh, then again, the unions who are opposing it have their own financial interests as well. All right. We've got about an extra minute left here. I want uh, two other issues, and that is uh, the Washington poll results, which yep. uh, you paid close attention to because yep. of uh, the governor's race. But they also showed that state voters would favor same-sex marriage if they were mm -hmm. asked to you know, vote yep. on a referendum. They also showed that they would favor marijuana legalization. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on those two issues? Uh, you know, on same-sex marriage, uh, I support civil unions. I support our existing law. went to the Supreme Court on an aspect of that to defend uh, uh, what was going on. But I have a traditional re you know, religious faith-based view of, of marriage. If the voters vote to approve it, then that's something I think the voters are capable of doing, and, and, and we'll move forward from that point. It is an issue that every voter is capable of deciding, and that's why it's appropriate for the ballot. On marijuana legalization, everything I see, including the latest brain research on youth who uh, use marijuana, shows that this newer, much more potent strain of marijuana that's dominant, 30 to 40 times more of the THC content than marijuana of 20 or 30 years ago, is, is not healthy. Uh, and, uh, you know, would increase social ills. I think 
that uh, marijuana should be available to people who are sick, who have glaucoma or cancer. It uh, should be available with a note from a doctor uh, or a prescription. But legalizing it, just having it sold everywhere, I think is a terrible idea. Okay, last question here. Probably the most important question. Is your daughter going to support you? She was, uh, your daughter Madeline, <laughs> yeah. uh, also uh, followed your footstep as a UW uh, president, student yeah. body president. But yeah. she supported uh, President Obama in yeah. 2008. Uh, did you convince her to vote for you in 2008? And will she support you here in 2012? Uh, uh, yes, she strongly supported me in, in 2008. And... Uh, she is the coalition's director on my campaign, working full-time on the campaign and doing a phenomenal job. Uh, and she represents exactly the kind of base expanding crossover voter that uh, is why we're going to win this race. Okay. Well, Rob McKenna, we will see how this all goes. It's going to be a marathon. We've got about another year left, and uh, we will talk more. Thank Great. you for your time. Thank you.